I want to talk to you today about Jesus is our peace, and I think you know that. And last week I spoke a little bit about God being our refuge, and we need to remember that when the storms of life rage, there is one who is a refuge, a shelter, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. He promises comfort and security when life rages on. His peace transcends the chaos of the moment. In his everlasting arms, we are secure. This Easter Sunday, our world is challenged. COVID-19 is wreaking havoc all over the world. Yet Jesus promises, despite the trials and circumstances of life, we can be at rest in him always. Even in the midst of a very serious situation as we're in now, we can be at rest and abide in his peace. Many are asking, even in the church, when will the suffering and distress of this virus end? When will things get back to normal? None of us know for sure, but as we follow the guidance of health experts, government leaders, and we continue to pray fervently, this storm will be minimized and the length of it shortened. It'll eventually end. So what do you do when the storm rages on? As I shared last week, you've got to shelter in place. You trust Jesus alone as your Savior, comforter, and refuge from the storm. You keep your eyes steadfast on him. Psalm 57.1, David writes of this type of trust when he fled from Saul to hide in the wilderness cave. He cried out, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. Aren't you glad the Lord's mercies are new and fresh every day? David said, for my soul trust in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. David was in a hard place, wrongly accused, persecuted, and fearing for his life. Though this severe, through this severe trial, he learned how to trust God in a storm. David learned through the trials and battles he faced that he could trust God always. And you see this through the progression of the life of David. From the time he was a young man, he learned how to trust God in every situation. He first faced the uh, the lion and the bear, and he took them down. Then he faced Goliath, and he took that giant down. And, and then when he was wrong, wrongly persecuted by Saul, he continued to keep his face steadfast in the eyes of God and trusting God. And he grew through that period, and the storm eventually passed. And David went on to become king and lead the nation in a mighty way. David said this in Psalm 27, 4. The Lord reminded me of this psalm just the other day, and it was so blessed me. David said this, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty or the delightfulness of the Lord. Because the Lord was David's desire and refuge, he could confidently say, the Lord is my life, Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I Shall I be afraid? David could rest securely in God because the Lord was his desire. It was the one thing, the main thing that he desired more than anything else was to dwell in the Lord's presence and to be in the Lord's house, to behold his beauty, to admire his presence, and to be comforted by his presence. David then could walk confidently through the situations he faced in life. Now, let's look at this a little closer about Jesus being our peace. Now, some of what I'm about to share with you is actually from a previous book I wrote, Fulfill Your Dreams, Chapter 7, called Worry-Free Living. I want to share a little bit of that, and I've added some things this morning. Now, the foundation for our peace and humanity's peace is Jesus. Peter encourages us in 1 Peter 5, 7, in the Common English Bible, throw all your anxiety onto him because he cares about you. And by the way, I don't have time to really break this verse down today, but that idea of throwing your anxiety or throwing your worry or your fear onto the Lord, it's actually got a violent connotation to it. It's actually a throw with force onto the Lord. And if you could picture Peter being a fisherman, taking one of those big heavy nets and throwing it over the side of the board, it wasn't a half-hearted throwing the net. It, was a, it took a lot of strength to throw those heavy nets. And so there's, a, there's an effort. You have to throw those anxieties onto the Lord because you know that he trusts for you and cares for you. So the first principle then to live free of worry and fear is to understand God never intended for you and I to carry these emotions. 
We know that Jesus is our peace. As Peter stated, we are to throw or cast them upon the Lord. I like what author John L. Mason wrote in his book. I read it many years ago, An Enemy Called Average. He said this, Fear and worry are interest paid in advance on something you may never own. When we worry and fear about things, sometimes we're making payments on something that we may never see realized in our lives. Before his crucifixion, Jesus shared the Passover meal. I'm going to go to John 14 here for a few minutes. Jesus shared the Passover meal with his 12 disciples. He knew that Jesus was a, uh, Judas was about to betray him and that soon he would return to his father. In John 14, Jesus discussed his departure with the disciples to prepare and empower them to walk in his peace. He was telling them what was about to happen so that when the events of the crucifixion and then his resurrection that would occur after was to happen, they would be ready. They wouldn't be fearful when he got abducted. He, they wouldn't be fearful when he suffered such a horrifying death on that cross. They could walk in his peace. John 14, 1, Jesus told them, Do not let your heart be troubled. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you may be also. Now, that English word troubled in this verse is translated from the Greek word terrazzo. And it means distressed or agitated. It also means to cause acute emotional distress or turbulence. To cause great mental distress. They weren't lightly troubled. They weren't a little bit worried. They were in deep emotional stress and extremely agitated when he began to tell them he was going to leave. The Greek word terrazzo describes a severe inner distress and agitation. And the root cause of this distress is worry and fear about circumstances. In the case of the disciples in John 14, their emotional distress was caused by worry and fear of the departure of Jesus. They did not understand it was better for Jesus to depart. Once crucified, resurrected, and ascended, Jesus would send the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to dwell in and with them, and likewise in and with all who believe. You can read this in John 14, verses 16 through 18. So Jesus is telling them this narrative in John 14 that he's about to go away. And then he says this in verse 6 of John 14. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now notice in this verse, Jesus is very clear. He is the way, but the destination is the Father. You see, Jesus' ultimate mission is to bring us to the bosom of the Father, and it will be enough for us. We read that in John 14, 8, Philip asked this question. He said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. That English word enough is from the Greek archaeo, and it means to be content or satisfied, filled with unfailing strength. It also means to ward off negative things from the world, such as fear and worry, which are the opposite of faith and peace. Philip and the other disciples wanted assurance of what Jesus taught and said to them. Let us see Father God, if I paraphrase for a moment. Let us see Father God, and we will be confident and strengthen Jesus. You see, they still didn't grasp, but Jesus and the Father were one. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Nor did they understand the Holy Spirit would come on Pentecost to fill all who believe with God's presence and strength. It was better that Jesus went away and that the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the friend, the guide, the one who strengthens us and gives us confidence in the midst of the storm would come and live and abide in those who believe in Jesus. But here's a greater truth. The revelation of the Father's love for you will strengthen and sustain you against worry and fear. You see, He is enough. As you gaze upon the face of God, circumstances look different, and you reflect His presence in peace. Again, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit affects this grace in our life. Now, Jesus went on in this 14th chapter. He said in verse 27 of the Amplified Bible, it says to the disciples, Peace I live with you. My perfect peace I give to you. Do you realize today he has given you perfect peace? He said, not as the world gives do I give to you. 
Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge. Jesus told the disciples not to worry, and he assured them he would care for and give them his peace. But what happened? They worried and became fearful. We often do the same. Like those first disciples, we often allow worry and fear to dominate our thinking and emotions when circumstances seem contrary to God's promises, or when the circumstances are beyond our ability to control them, or our circumstances are beyond our ability to fully understand them. Again, back to our current COVID-19 pandemic and the situation that it's caused. Yes, it is a, it's a horrible situation, but we have to remember that in it all, Jesus has never left us, not for the slightest moment. Jesus, in fact, is trying to draw us and all of humanity closer to him. Again, he's working all things together for our good, Romans 8.28. And so we can rest confidently in him that his peace will guide us through this situation. But when we allow our minds and our hearts to run with fear or worry over what could happen or what is going around us, we remove ourselves from that place of perfect peace. Many years ago, we were youth, uh, youth pastors in a church in Daytona, Florida, and we had taken a team, I've shared this story with our church here before, but for you newer folks or those watching, maybe you've not heard this. We had taken a team down to Guatemala, a missions team, a youth team, and we had a wonderful time down there for the week, and we helped build a, a, a school building down there and ministered in churches, and it was just a wonderful, powerful time. And when we left, uh, we had left our, our van, our personal van, in the driveway of our home there in Daytona. And we got back late. We had taken some rent-a-cars to the airport from Daytona down to Miami and, and the rent-a-cars back. And we get in late that night on a Saturday night, almost midnight, uh, with the rent-a-car. And I notice in the driveway as we're walking in the house that the van isn't there. And I asked Caroline, I said, well, do we let somebody in the church borrow the van while we're gone? And she said, no, I, I don't think we did. And I started thinking, and no, no. And all of a sudden, that, that moment of fear and panic hit me. Oh, no. Our van's been stolen. And so we get our luggage into the house. We get our daughter Hannah in. We get settled in. And I make a phone call. And by this time, it's well after midnight on a Saturday night. And we're supposed to be at church the next day to give a report about our missions trip to Guatemala and all the great things God did. And I get a hold of someone at the police department. And, and sure enough, they, they said, yes, your, your, your van was stolen. The good news is the van was recovered. Uh, it's in the police impound yard. Uh, You'll need a check for $175 Monday morning. You'll have to have your driver's license, and then you can come pick up the van. And, and you know, at that time in our lives, $175 was a lot of money, and my mind just began to race about what happened to the van. And, you know, the, the person I spoke to said there was some, some, some damage to the van, but it was recovered. And, and so, so my mind, I can hardly sleep Saturday night. I, I'm angry that the van got stolen. Uh, I'm not grateful that it got recovered. I'm angry that it got stolen. I'm angry that it's, it's been damaged. I'm, I'm upset that I got to write a check for $175 to get something back that's rightfully mine. It just seems unjust, right? And all of this stuff is going through my mind. I, I'm in such agitation. I am so troubled. I'm so terrazzo over this situation that it's causing a deep emotional stress for me that by the time I wake up Sunday morning, I'm not much good to anybody. I'm not really being a good husband. I'm very upset. I'm very grumpy. I'm agitated. And we get to the church, and uh, I run into our pastor, and he's passed away now. And Rodney looks at me, and he's so excited. He's so full of joy. And he goes, oh, tell, I'm so excited to hear about all the mission strip. And I can't hardly get anything out of my mouth other than our van was stolen, and it's in the police in impound van. And, I'm, and it was obvious that I was very upset and very distraught. And um, he very wisely didn't have me share that Sunday morning about our missions trip. And so what happened then through the rest of the, you know, I was miserable through the service. Nothing would comfort me. Nothing my wife said would comfort me. And I went through the rest of that day just miserable. And the story just continues. For like 48 hours, I'm allowing my emotions and my fear of what could happen or what did happen to the van and how bad the situation was going to be to just dominate my thinking and dominate my, my attitude. It was affecting me physically. 
the stress of the whole thing. So Monday morning, I, I get the, the money order. Uh, the, yeah, they wouldn't let us get a check. You had to have a money order or, or a bank check. And so I got to go to the bank. I got to get the money order for $175. I'm upset about that. I get to the police impound yard, and, and there it is. And they, she, she give her the stuff, show her my license. And she goes, oh, it's in the back. And I get back there, and the van looks terrible. It's all dirty. And on the outside, the window had been broken out. And, and uh, you know, rain had gotten on the inside. There were, it smelled. There was food left in there and clothes that looked like they'd been stolen from Walmart or something was inside there. Uh, the, the dashboard was all messed up and just all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, great. I get in the van and I'm driving away and I'm so angry and I'm driving it to the, to take it to the Dodge dealer to get fixed. And, and I, I'm just really, really upset. And then about halfway in my journey, all of a sudden, I look down, and I see the ashtray laying in the floor, and it's got a crack pipe in it. And I see what looks like a piece of crack in there. I don't know. I've never seen crack up close. And I see that laying there, and I'm like, this is great. I'm going to get pulled. I'll probably get pulled over by the police and arrested because of this, whoever stole my van and all of this. And I'm just fuming. And about, I don't know, a light or two later, stoplight on there, and I'm just, just so upset. And the Lord says to me, Bob, will you forgive the man? Very clear, he just spoke to me, just his mercy. He said, will you forgive the man that stole your van? And when he said that, in that moment, it just pierced my heart. And I just got a glimpse of this person in bondage in every way in their life possible, sitting in jail because they had caught the man. And, um, and I just said, yes, Lord, I'll forgive him. And all of a sudden, I just got I said, Lord, forgive me for being so angry and so upset with him and at this situation and so grumpy to everybody and just miserable. And I just went through that process and just began to forgive and release it. See, God never intended us to carry these things. He said, throw your anxiety on him. Throw your cares on him, right? For he cares for you. And so I began to do that. And by the time I got to the Dodge dealer, and I was beginning to praise God and you know, I was actually happy and joyful. I found that place of peace again. In the midst of a situation that was beyond my control, I had nothing to do with it. Jesus was with me the whole way when I finally just released it. And now as I'm handing the keys to the person, I'm, I'm actually happy and joyful, and I, I probably think I'm a little strange, right? And so I never did meet the man who stole the van. I continued to pray for him. And uh, the detective later called me, uh, you know, a few days later, and they said, you know, because we caught the man in the van, but the van wasn't running, we couldn't charge him with grand theft auto, so we had to release him. He's got priors and things that he's, he's done. But, and I just kept praying for the man, and, and I just believe maybe one day I'll meet him on the other side of eternity, and, and perhaps uh, he gave his life to Christ, or maybe came back to Christ. And so we just have to live understanding that when we allow the worry, so I was dealing with unforgiveness and anger, and now I let my emotions of worry and fear get the best of me. I'm assuming the worst in a situation. We're not going to have the money to get the van fixed. We're not going to, you know, the van's going to this, that, and just everything. It just ruined my state of being. And so as I was reflecting on this, this, this week, and of course this coronavirus and everything that we're enduring, I mean, it's it's hard being isolated from one another. It's hard. We, we, we see the news reports of the suffering and the death and, and now the economic uh, havoc that this thing is wreaking. And some of you watching maybe have already lost your jobs or reduction in hours. And it's got all of us concerned, right? But it's a situation beyond our control. But yet Jesus, what did he say? In the midst of everything, I promise you my peace, right? And so here's the thing. The coronavirus, if you will, is refining us, just like every trial will. Every trial refines us, right? It's refining us, and it's also defining us. It's in moments like this, when you're going through a severe trial, that you really find out what the metal, if you will, of your faith is made of. Our faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, right? It is refined by these trials. We read this in the New Testament. It's refined by the things we go through in life. And in this particular case, the whole world is being tried almost simultaneously in this intense, uh, fiery trial that we're in. And the church actually, globally, simultaneously is being refined. And if you'll see it for a moment, 
It is a glorious thing. I'm not saying the virus is a glorious thing or the havoc that it's wreaking. No. But what the purity that's going to come out of the church, the church is going to become more like Christ through this if we allow it to refine and define us and not grow bitter, not grow angry at God, but rather say, okay, God, I don't understand, but I'm going to praise you in the midst of the storm. I'm going to praise you through the midst of this trial. I'm going to trust you through it all. We have an opportunity then individually and as families to grow stronger, and the church has an opportunity to become more radiant in Christ. And, and by the way, on my Thursday night Bible study, I'm really feeling strongly as I've been praying about the last couple of days uh, to go back through the book of Ephesians. I did a study five, I think it was like five years ago, the book of Ephesians, the glorious church, and I feel like the Lord wants me to revisit that. So I want to go back to the book of Ephesians starting this Thursday night and begin to look at that because I really believe what's happening. It's such a beautiful book, Ephesians, about the glorious triumphant church, and you see that through Paul's writing. It's one of his most beautiful books that he wrote. And so uh, I just want to look at that. Anyways, let's, let's take a look at the effects of stress and worry here. Now, what happens with worry? It causes stress and fear. I went through that with the van, and every, every situation in my life, every storm that I've gone through, that I've allowed the stress of the moment or the worry and the fear of the moment get the better of me, all of a sudden, I begin to feel it in my body. You see, our body can pr- uh, process small amounts of stress. However, excessive stress, whether real or perceived, sometimes we're fabricating stress in our minds because we're fearing the worst of something that's never going to happen. It can create emotional, mental, and physical problems. Now, I shared this scripture last week. I'll share it again from the New Living Translation, Proverbs 14.30. We're told that a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Conversely, then, a heart-filled with worry and fear, can open the door to health issues. You see, prolonged stress depletes your immune system. Stress hinders your ability to emotionally process the demands of life and weakens your body. Stress can create unhealthy fear and phobias. Fear can cause you to panic and freeze in crisis. Listen, the world is in a moment of crisis right now, right? We all realize that. We don't want to give in to fear, to worry that causes fear, and to to allow that pervade us. Not only is it affecting us emotionally and hindering our body and weakening our immune system, it may cause us to freeze, to panic in this situation and do something irrational, right? Don't want to do that. Unresolved stress and fear hinder you from living in God's peace. In her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, a cognitive neuroscience researcher, she stated that 87% of the illnesses plaguing people today are a direct result of their negative thought life. Now, in this current pandemic, it's complicated. There's a lot of physiological aspects to it. But one thing they've said over and over again is that the stronger your immune system is, the better you are able to fight off this virus or any virus or bacteria. So we want to do what we can then to not allow our emotions to get the better of us so that we can have a strong immune system and healthy body. Her research indicated that toxic emotions can cause migraines, hypertension, strokes, cancer, skin problems, diabetes, infections, and allergies. She concludes... Our thoughts affect us physically and emotionally. Her studies indicate fear triggers 1,400 known physical and chemical responses and activates 30 different hormones and neurotransmitters. Now, this is interesting because the book of Proverbs actually had something to say about some of this. Proverbs 12.25. It discusses the effects of unresolved anxiety or worry in, in a person's life. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary definition of anxiety is a painful or apprehensive uneasiness of mind, usually over an impending or anticipated ill. It it may not even going to be happening, but we think it is. We anticipate it. A fearful concern or interest. So it's no surprise then that the writer of Proverbs indicated anxiety can lead to depression. Now, not all depression is caused by 
anxiety, worry, and fear. There are cases of mental illness. There are physiological conditions, brain chemical disorders that can cause acts and forms of depression. But what I'm talking about today is when, we, when healthy people allow worry and fear to dominate them, it can actually lead to forms of depression. And so just as Carolyn Leaf has now discovered with studying uh, the neuroscience aspect of this, we don't want any type of illness because of negative thinking. Imagine that 87% of illnesses plaguing people a direct result of their negative thought life. Uh, so we really need to guard our hearts, right, and keep our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 tells us, to guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. And there's many aspects to that uh, scripture. Certainly, your spiritual life and your relationship to God and walking in purity and wholeness. But, but it also affects your physical life and everything. So when we allow worry then to rule in our heart, it can lead then to undue stress, fear, and as I just stated, some forms of depression. But we have a choice. We can trust God or live in worry. For the Christian, worry is characteristic of unbelief. It can be a manifestation of a lack of faith in God's promises. But what I've discovered is persistent anxiety breeds fear. Don't let anxiety persist in your life. It will breed fear. Something I read a few years ago, and I... I thought this was very inter interesting, some statistics on fear. Did you know that 40% of what you worry about will never happen? Alternatively, are you aware that 30% of what concerns you are things from the past that, you cannot, that cannot be changed? Likewise, do you realize that only 10% of what you worry about are considered significant issues? Only 10%. Did you know that 12% are about health-related issues that will never happen? This means that an overwhelming 92% of what you and everyone else and I spend so much time worrying over will never take place. Most of what we're concerned about is never going to happen. We think the worst, we begin to fear. And again, if we don't keep our emotions and our thoughts in check, they can run wild in our lives and move us from a place of faith, but move us from Jesus who is our peace. Now, Regarding these legitimate concerns, we need to learn how to trust God's provision for peace and joy during life's challenges. I like what Benjamin Franklin said about worry. He said, do not anticipate trouble or worry about what may never happen. Keep in the sunlight. Now, he was talking about the sunshine but let's keep in the sun, S-O-N, light. Let's keep in the light of Jesus. Let's keep in the light of his countenance and his peace, right? We don't need to worry about things, much of which is never going to happen. It's good advice for all of us. Again, when worry and fear control us, we rob ourselves of the authority God has given us as his child and as a citizen of heaven. I like what John said in John 1.12. He says, but as many as received him, in other words, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. You see, in Christ, when we accept his free gift of eternal life, and when he shed that blood on the cross so long ago, and he ro rose from the dead, he gave us a way to be reconciled to the Father. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father or to know who Father God is except through him. And when we receive that, we're not only adopted into God's family and we're legitimate sons and daughters of the king, but we're citizens of heaven. We've been given the authority of the name of Christ. We've been given the authority of the power of his name and of the kingdom. And God wants us to operate in that realm as sons and daughters, confident, not fearful, right? And so we're secure. But what happens when unchecked negative thinking and emotions and words that we allow to, to come out of our mouth or emanate from our hearts it can create ungodly beliefs in our mind, which then can empower demonic forces against us. And that's another study for another time, but you can look at 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. 
Jesus has stripped the devil. We have to remember this. The glory of the resurrection is that Christ took the suffering, the pain, and the judgment that was due us on that cross, and then three days later, he rises triumphantly, and it strips the devil of the authority that was taken from men in the Garden of Eden, and now he's commissioned you and I as his sons and daughters with his authority. But the enemy can regain power over us when through our unbelief or our agreement with this, when we agree with this falsehoods. And so when you and I agree with the enemy's lies, we relinquish then the authority Jesus has entrusted to us, and by default we empower the enemy against us. So in this storm or any storm that you may face in life, you, you don't want to give in to the fear of what could happen or the lies of the enemy. And oftentimes, by the way, that fear, it's coming from him. He begins to, you just get little thoughts running through your mind and, and negativity begins, it, it, the, the root source of it's demonic in many cases. And we begin to, if we begin to agree with that, we're empowering the enemy against us. And again, it's another teaching for another time, but if you look at Jesus and how he's tempted those 40 days in the wilderness before he started his earthly ministry, and then the devil comes at him three times, and, and you know this passage, and what does Jesus do? He tells the devil, it is written. He refused to agree with his distortion of the word of God, by the way. And he says, no, it is written, right? And so we need to recognize that. And then even when before he went to the cross, and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying, and it's such a, a struggle. And he goes, he finally says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. So we see also that, that Jesus stays in a place of surrender to the Father's will, and by doing so, by saying in, staying in the Father's will, he stays in a place of peace and confidence, even though he's about to face something that is horrific and beyond anything we can imagine. And so, as we learn how to live out of a relationship with God and the truth of His Word, it empowers us then to live free of worry and fear. Further then, we're going to be confident when the battles rage around you. Can you imagine David, young David, as he's, as he's running out against Goliath, right? He is confident. Why? Because he's seen God not only defeat the lion and the bear, but because of his time in the presence of the Lord, and he has set the Lord always before him, he is confident, and he is at peace. Even though there's a battle and he's facing even death, he knows that God is going to be with him, and God's going to get him through it no matter what the outcome would be. I shared this last week, but I'll remind you, Isaiah 26.3, the prophet Isaiah said this, you will keep him in perfect peace, those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Now, that English word steadfast is from the Hebrew samach, and it means to lean upon, to take hold of, and it means to do whatever is necessary to sustain an active focus. You and I in this moment especially need to do whatever it takes in our lives to keep an active, engaged focus where the Lord, we have set the Lord before us. Like David, one thing I have desired, to see the Lord, to dwell in His presence, right? And so as we do that and we're setting the Lord before us, we're then confident. And here's what I didn't get into last week. But now His perfect peace, this Jesus, who is our peace, His perfect peace is given to us. And that word peace is from the Hebrew shalom, and it means peace. It also means prosperity. It means an intact state of favorable circumstance. It also means completeness, the state of totality of a collection. It also means safeness and salvation, a state of being free from danger. It means health, a state of lack of disease and wholeness or well-being. It means satisfaction and contentment, the state of having one's basic needs or more being met and so being content. And boy, we need that right now, and especially for those of you that are going through some of the economic hardship of what's happening with this current situation. You need to be in a place of satisfaction and contentment. That's his peace. That's his shalom. That's that fullness, that salvation, that state of being free from danger, that place of health, that state of lack of disease and wholeness or well-being. We need to embrace the fullness of what his peace, what his shalom is. Jesus is our peace. Again, concentrating upon the truth of God's promises will create peace, shalom in your life. An abiding relationship with Jesus grows your confidence that God will keep 
his promises. Most of us are aware that God promises, uh, are aware uh, he promises in his word to protect us, to deliver, and to provide for us, but few of us act really confidently upon these promises. However, during these challenging circumstances that we face in life, oftentimes what happens for many of us if we're not really acting in total confidence is we see God as a distant friend or maybe a harsh judge or an unloving father, perhaps. God is none of these. He's a good father. Lack of relationship and intimacy with God can create an underdeveloped faith and trust. Sometimes the dysfunction even of our own parents can distort our view of God. But as we spend time with God through prayer, worship, and His Word, and we learn that we're really adopted, we're citizens, we're valued, we're loved, nothing will separate us from His love. Never nothing, right? All of a sudden, our relationship deepens, our faith and trust grow, and worry begins to flee. And so learning to trust God and His promises despite the present circumstances, it's vital to remaining in God's peace, growing in faith, and living a victorious life. The cautions Jesus gave the 12 disciples still hold true for us today. Peace is to be the standard characteristic for the follower of Christ. The world is looking for peace right now. The church has an opportunity then to show that peace, and it's going to come as we stay steadfast, focused on Him, focused on Jesus, our Prince of Peace. And so, final thoughts. As a believer, you have been united with Christ. Remember, in his resurrection, you've been united with his death. Paul writes about this in Romans 6. You've been united with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so that resurrection is both now and future. We have resurrection hope now. In fact, the very same spirit, Paul writes, that rose Christ from the dead lives and dwells within you and I. And so we have resurrection hope and we have resurrection authority in his name and by the spirit in us to speak to situations that are dark and hopeless and to speak life. And God wants us to do that in this hour. We're no longer an orphan or fearful slaves, but we're beloved children of God. We're citizens of his kingdom with all of God's rights and privileges as Jesus is. So are you and I now, completely accepted and loved by the Father. We are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, Paul wrote in Romans 8 about. The fact that he defeated the powers of darkness and ascended to the throne empowers you and I to walk in his authority. The basis of our peace is the reality that Jesus has overcome the world. That's what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday and every day as a believer. You can live in Christ and his victory free from fear and worry. Do not allow your present circumstances or this COVID-19 to rob you of your security in Christ. Jesus is the essence of your existence. Your peace flows from him. Your security and success is found in God. And he has empowered you to do the impossible in your generation because he is with you. Keep your heart at peace by staying focused on Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So life to your body by staying in agreement with him. Let his peace guard your heart so that you can be equipped to live the abundant life he has promised you. Amen. Now, church, I want to get ready and take communion with all of you. And again, begin to get your communion elements. And Pastor Carolyn, if you want to come up here. And as we get ready, I'm going to read some out of Matthew 26. And as she's coming, in Matthew 26, Jesus celebrating that Passover meal just before he goes to the to the cross. They're celebrating And Jesus took the bread, he blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for behold, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so before we participate of the communion elements, remember the 
real presence of Christ is with us here and in your homes as we take this communion elements. But I, I want us to take a moment and let's give thanks. Let's give thanks for our health that we have, for our families, our marriages that we have, our, our children. Let's give thanks for what he has done for us. The very thank, uh, thanks for the fact that Jesus died for us and we celebrate this day. And we have that resurrection hope, that future hope, again, both now and present and future of what he's done for us. But let's also give thanks for a moment for all those in our community and around the world that have risked their own health and lives to serve our community during this pandemic. Uh, you have the medical community. You have doctors and nurses and, and uh, anesthesiologists and all of these that are working so hard in our hospitals to care for those that are sick and with the COVID-19 and others who are sick during this time. And and uh, uh, in some cases, not having the medical equipment that they need, the PPE equipment. And so we need to give thanks for them and their willingness to lay their lives down. We need to keep them in prayer. We also need to be, give thanks and, and are grateful for our first responders, the police, the firemen, the ambulance workers, and, and all that they're doing. They're on the front lines as well as they're helping people get to the hospitals in some cases. And so we need to just continue to thank, give thanks and pray for them. What about our grocery store workers and, and our farmers and all of those that are continuing to work to make sure America stays fed? So we need to give thanks for them and, and our pharmacy workers and, and making sure that those that need prescription meds and everything can get those things during this time. And, and then you got delivery drivers, you know, UPS and FedEx and Amazon drivers, all these that are continuing to deliver. And, and the list goes on. Think of all the ones that are working, that are still working actively and, and sometimes interacting with the public so that you and I can continue life in some semblance of normalcy, and yet they put their lives at risk. And so, Father, right now we give thanks to these, and we're grateful for them, Father, and we bless them, and we thank you for your covering and your presence over them. And we ask, God, that you would shield those in our, our congregation, God. And we thank you, Father, for that Psalm 91 promise and the promises throughout your word that no plague would come near our dwelling and no harm should come us. And we declare that over them, Father, and over their families, God. In Jesus' name, we speak peace, God, in Jesus' name. Something else I'd like us to do here real quickly before we take communion. If there's an area of unforgiveness in your heart towards anyone or, or maybe you're even upset with government leaders or whatever and you don't agree with some things that have been done, I, take a moment to ask forgiveness and release them. But also, as a congregation, we've We've prayed, we've decreed against this virus, but I think also today it would be appropriate to also ask the Lord for forgiveness as a nation. We need to ask God for his mercy where we have sinned and fallen short. As I said last week, God's not judging this nation or any nation. It's God's desire that he'd reconcile the world through what Christ has done on the cross. We're in this age of grace, and God's love for humanity is to reconcile the world. But that said... When man persists in sin or a nation persists in sin, we can take ourselves from the care and the protection of God. God wants us as a nation to make him our refuge. Sadly, in our nation, we have many ills, and I don't want to spend on this Easter Sunday much highlighting that other than to say we've fallen short in many ways as a nation. And so we need to ask God to forgive us. God loves humanity, but his heart breaks over injustice and sinful behavior. Jesus came to liberate humanity from the power of sin that we would be made righteous in him and empowered by the Spirit to live a holy life. And if you're watching this, this Easter Sunday and your life has not been wholly surrendered unto the Lord, I would encourage you to ask God's mercy today and say, Lord, I, I, I need Jesus in my life and I, I, I don't want to agree, agree with that sinful behavior or that wrong that's out there that I've been involved in. And so, Father, I ask for your mercy and I ask for your forgiveness over our nation today. And I thank you that you're a loving God and you love humanity and your heart breaks over the injustice and the sin of society and the behavior that we can find ourselves in, even in the church. And so, God, I'm asking God for your forgiveness today. And we're asking, Father, that blood of Christ that forgives of all sin. You said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I ask God, not only over our lives individually and as a congregation and our families, but I ask for a nation, God, today. You'd forgive us when we've called evil good and good evil. And you'd forgive us of our behavior and when we've violated the truth of what your word says. 
And so, Father, we ask for your forgiveness today, and we ask, God, for a healing of our nation. And the scourge of sin, as much as the scourge of COVID-19, would be lifted from our land, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your blood that was shed. So let's take of the elements together. He took the bread there in your homes. Jesus, we thank you for your love, your forgiveness, and we participate. We thank you for the healing that comes through this act of communion in your body that was broken for us. Lord, we thank you for your blood that was given for us, and we celebrate and we take right now the celebration of the new covenant that was given in your blood. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sin, for the healing of our body. And Lord, I release healing right now to those that need healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you. And so, church, I just want to encourage you, um, if you need prayer for anything, get ready to call this number. Uh, that test me. I was so blessed to hear from Pastor Sam how someone called in with chronic arthritis, and as they prayed for them over the phone, they were healed. Others called and were greatly encouraged by their ministry and prayer over the phone. So I just encourage you this Easter Sunday, if you need prayer for anything, call and I just want to pray for one last thing as I go. I just want to pray the blessing, the shalom blessing over all of us. Lord, I just pray right now the shalom of God, the shalom of Christ, who is our peace over us. Lord, I speak your peace, your prosperity over your people. I speak your completeness, God, over your people. I speak your salvation and your safeness over your people. I speak your health over your people, God. And I speak your satisfaction and contentment over your people. The shalom of God over your people today on this Easter Sunday, this resurrection day. Jesus, you are our peace. We love you. We thank you. Amen. Church, have a great Sunday, the rest of your uh, Easter resurrection celebration day. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen and amen. God bless.